Donald Trump and Nebraska Governor Jim Jim Pillen were apparently inspired by Charlie Kirk. Boy, we're really in the bad place um, when uh, when Charlie Kirk is dictating policy. Among the the Charlie Kirk things we've seen over the years, this this does not really break like the top ten of like uh, like objectionable. Yeah, <laughs> I'm kind of oh like oh, okay. doesn't break the top ten of this week. That's pretty- yeah, he was, exactly. He was talking like about that. how birth control make women depressed this week. No, it's the men they're having sex with, as on birth control, that are making them depressed. Sorry. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Hello, welcome to the Next Level Podcast. It's Tim Miller in the host chair. God damn it, I gotta keep hosting again, because uh, JVL is out this week. I'm here with my best friend from the mid-aughts, Sarah Longwell, and an a aspiring new friend, and mentee <laughs> Andrew Egger. Uh, I'm just. I don't think you can identify. <laughs> I don't think you can identify somebody as your mentee. I think they have to tap you as mentor. Oh, that's how that works. Okay. I do think so. Okay, whatever. I've got a wide range of people that I aspire to want to be my mentee, but maybe maybe not all of them will will you know kind of fit that fit that requirement. Andrew, how you doing? I'm nice great, hat. Tim. How are you? Nice hat. Oh, you were worried you. about your look for YouTube, and I think you look nice. So I don't well, know. Well, that's so nice of you to say. Yeah, I think I think it came together okay. Myself. Okay. Um, well, uh, JVL is on spring break. I'm also on spring break, which is not a break. I have four children in my home. Uh, my nephews and nieces are here, and so if you hear random yelps during the podcast, um, that is just me enjoying. A beach holiday, um, Sarah. Uh, you, I, I've, I've, I'm, I'm over the Republican primary. I'm done with it. I've been done with it for like a month. I, I just, I can't bring myself to care. And yet, we have people like you who are still, and Bill Crystal, who are still analyzing the county by county numbers, looking for that diamond in the rough, <laughs> looking for that little bit of proof that Joe Biden might really win after all. And so, I'd like to hear your analysis of what happened in Wisconsin last night. This is not about the primary. This is about the general election. This is about identifying the voters who don't want to vote for Donald Trump and could be potentially gettable for Joe Biden. And last night, just like when the Arizona primary sort of came out of nowhere, that almost 20 percent, I think it was 18 percent of Republicans in Arizona came out to vote against Donald Trump at a time when they the alternatives weren't even technically on the ballot. They were there to vote for, but they have already dropped out of this race. And so last night in Wisconsin, to see 70,000 Republicans, uh, I think it was ultimately 72,000 by this morning, uh, vote against Donald Trump, vote for Nikki Haley specifically. And then you drop on top of that. Don't forget he, Ron DeSantis. Well, I was going to say, 3. he got 3%. Yeah. yeah, he got a little over 3%. And then there was... um. It's not, uh, it's, what's the one that they can check that, uh, it's like uncommitted, I think is the, they uh, called it was, uninstructed, which is uninstructed. Very yeah. It was very a weird British. name, weird name, but all that, if you add up Ronnie D, you add up Nikki and you add up the unrequited or whatever, <laughs> you get a hundred percent, you get like a hundred thousand voters who last night in the Wisconsin Republican primary said no to Trump. He didn't even crack 80%. That's that's meaningful. Um, now look, and, and here's one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot is, you know, Joe Biden, this story is there for Joe Biden too, right? There's a story about people, especially in Michigan, you saw the uncommitted uh, turnout to send a message, right? Protest voting. And so these are essentially message sending deals whenever you see these numbers like this, right? Because nobody thinks Nikki Haley is actually going to win. And the uncommitted, uh, you know, thing in Michigan is just to scare Joe Biden into doing, you know, what Rashida Tlaib wants and actually and what a lot of progressive voters want. But the thing, I think that there is more likely, it is more likely those progressives who are mad about uh, Gaza, they're not going to vote for Donald Trump. Like, whereas they vote for Jill Stein. They might vote for Jill Stein, it's true. But the Nikki Haley voters could vote for Joe Biden, a percentage of them. Sure, some of them probably did. Many of them probably did. Well, for sure, many of them did. There's no doubt that in that number, and I think people, you can really overread the Nikki Haley numbers. uh, Because if you don't understand that a bunch of those people have been voting for Democrats, even though they're right-leaning independents and soft GOP voters, you're over overtelling the story. But, you know, Wisconsin went for Biden by 20,000 votes. So in terms of holding 
the anti-Trump coalition together, I, I do read, it's certainly not bad news. I'm not saying it's everything, but I think it's still worth looking at. And it's very much worth being able to identify for me, right? Because I am in the in addition to the podcasting business, in addition to the appealing Republican-ish voters off of Trump, that to me is a lot of, it's a lot to work with. Speaking of which, I want Edgar's take on this, but before we get to that, I wanted to also acknowledge your your other co-host on your other podcast, you Cheated on Me, with George Conway, news story out today that he he's give, he gave the maximum donation, almost a million dollars to Joe Biden. So you got, in that podcast, George Conway explains it all to Sarah Longwell. There's a lot of activism associated with with that podcast i would say yeah i think that's true i mean i don't know if you've noticed but neither george conway nor i and despite us being very different people uh neither of us want donald trump to be the president again mm. in a deep deep way mm -hmm. and uh i appreciate and I your will... commitment to that cause yeah thank you uh wisconsin one other thing i just want to mention sarah we took that uh, remember we took that uh, mailbag question on the board podcast from the person thinking oh, yeah, of moving to door move? county i don't know if she moved or not but huge turnout for nikki 13 and a half percent in door county yep. um big numbers um uh the unrequited uh three three percent um edgar do you share sarah's optimism i i, I i'm not sure that i do so you know, you feel feel free to tell her that, she, that this you don't is, have to give him funny. permission to disagree with me. <laughs> he can do it on his own. He's no, a big no, boy. So... He's a big boy. He can does he can have his own opinions. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the best way to to um, gloss all this. I do think it's important that that you know there's a specific political aim for like the the. Yeah, now you got unrequited in my mind. I don't even remember what the, what the actual word was. Unconstructed uh, vote. I mean, they're they're trying to accomplish a particular political purpose with that vote right now, which is not necessarily incompatible with them going back uh, and voting for Biden in November. Whereas there really isn't any kind of like uh, organized drive on the Republican side to do anything other than kind of wait for Donald Trump to lock up this nomination. And, uh, and I, I do think when you see these people still showing up and still pulling the lever for Haley, it's not even really that, I mean, yes, I mean, we, we talk about like the, the crossover vote from Democrats and things like that. And that was a, an important part of a lot of the early primaries. There was actually kind of like a, the, we talk about that primary pivot group where there was an actual organized effort to get Republicans to come out and boost Nikki Haley. But I mean, that's no longer happening. There's no, there's no real purpose to any of that anymore. It's just, it's just voters kind of showing up in their genuine feelings and uh, and and casting a ballot for somebody other than Trump. And that's the thing that's going to be sticky um, in, into November. I mean, who knows what the what the geopolitical situation with the war in Gaza is going to look like by the time the election actually rolls around. Um, Biden has already, you know, pulled back significantly from his kind of early, very staunchly pro Netanyahu government um, kind of allyship there. So, you know, it, it does seem to me that that you know one of these problems on on Biden's side could be shrinking. Who knows what that will end up looking like by November? Whereas the other is is more just kind of this baseline dissatisfaction on the Republican side with these people still showing up for Haley. We are going to get to Gaza if you're just buckle up, folks. Um, Wait, can I just say one last thing on this, which is about enthusiasm? I have. Okay, a, can so I can I give you my negative point and then you can oh, give yeah, a sure. positive? Okay. Here's, my, yeah, here's yeah, yeah. why I'm negative on this. I, I've just okay. been sitting here scrolling, county to county. You know, Adams, we're in rural, rural, Taylor, Rusk, Nikki Haley's at seven, three, four, Madison, 24%, almost yeah. a quarter of the vote in Madison. I just, I, I don't think that those people were Donald Trump voters. I, I, I just don't. I, I don't, I don't know that, that there's any evidence that this 6,642 people that we're adding to the, to Donald Trump's, uh, or to, excuse me, to Joe Biden's narrow victory in Wisconsin last time. And so I just don't know how excited I'm supposed to get about people that I think largely probably were not Donald Trump Oh, well, Trump let me tell you. Time. Can I tell you why Please. you should be excited? Please. Uh, I would love to the, be excited. Okay. The reason is, is that Joe Biden won Wisconsin last time. He has to hold oh, right. that That's coalition okay. together. He, right? He won it last time. Donald he didn't Trump lose claimed it. that he lied about it. I do like to, you know, we ignore Donald Trump's speeches. Yesterday in, at an event in Wisconsin, Donald Trump talked about how, how he won Wisconsin, which is obviously a lie and led to the storming of the Capitol. And that does, didn't make the newspapers. But we do mention that on this podcast. He also did uh, that little press conference in front of all of those uh, cops wearing their uniforms. Yeah, it was in Michigan. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, and I just, as a throwaway side thing, um, I, I, I think that police officers who stand with Donald Trump, there's a lot of commentary about how like, oh, they're standing with this guy who has all these felonies. How about this is a guy who had people attack their brothers and sisters in blue? How about that? How about the fact that they didn't care that those people's that those other cops' lives were in danger? It doesn't seem uh, like people are standing on their thin blue line very well here, back in the blue very efficiently anyway. Side side thing. Concur. Back back to Wisconsin. Uh, so so the two points that I would make is that Joe Biden has to hold his anti Trump coalition together and and need to continue to win a place like Wisconsin's a tipping point state. Like he has got to win Wisconsin. The blue wall is the thing again, and that'll take us to Nebraska here in a second. But like Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, he has to win those, especially because I think he's going to struggle harder uh, with Georgia and Nevada and, and maybe even Arizona. But the reason that I care so much is that when people show up at a, they take the time to get off the couch, to go take time out of their day to vote against somebody, that's an enthusiasm indicator. That is a, I will take any minute that I've got to go vote against this guy. And you need to, I think with this, the negativity of this rematch and people feeling really like blah about it, to see that kind of enthusiasm to go out and like, take a shot at Trump for no reason, that makes me feel good about where people's enthusiasm to vote against him is currently. I agree with that. I, yeah. I agree that there's an enthusiastic core of people that are excited to vote against Donald Trump. Uh, yeah. I, I'm worried that that is not the people that really kind of are going to matter in the end. Um, but I, I, I'll take it. I'll take the pony. I'll take it. Um, I want to move on to Nebraska. Uh, Donald Trump... Uh, Charlie Kirk and Nebraska Governor Jim Pillen are working together. Um, or I guess, excuse me, Donald Trump and Nebraska Governor Jim K Jim Pillen were apparently inspired by Charlie Kirk. Uh, so boy, we're really in a bad place um, when uh, when Charlie Kirk is dictating policy. Um, but uh, they uh, Charlie pointed out that it's not great for uh, MAGA. Uh, and the coming MAGA autocracy for Nebraska to divide its electoral votes uh, by congressional district. You might know that Nebraska has five uh, electoral votes and that uh, uh, there are three, they get two for a statewide, they give two to the statewide winner and then one to each congressional district. Um, the Omaha congressional district held by Don Bacon is very swingy. Uh, Joe Biden won it last time. And uh, so as a result, now the uh, N Nebraska is looking at changing the 1991 law that, uh, that divided up the electors and having it be winner take all like all the other states. Um, this is important for this reason. Uh, you mentioned the big blue wall there. If J uh, Joe Biden wins all of the states that he won, or no, excuse me, if Joe Biden of, of the swing states Loses Nevada, Arizona, Georgia, North Carolina. Loses the Sun Belt. Loses the heavily Hispanic states. But wins the upper Midwest blue wall, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. That takes them to a gentleman's 269 not-that-nice electoral votes because that would send the election to, into the House of Representatives. If, the, if Nebraska does separate out its districts and he wins the Don Bacon district, which he should, that would take him to 270 and make him the president of these United States. Um, so, significant. There is an offset, though, also, that if Nebraska did this, then our friends in Maine, where there is a Democratic trifecta, where it's the other state, where this, which is the inverse of Nebraska, that has the same law, but there is a rural red district that went for Donald Trump, Maine could change their laws and offset this um, to make Maine winner take all. Edgar, what do you think about, about, the, about the machinations here? How important is this? I guess I'm a little surprised it hadn't been done or attempted before. Um, I guess it's just it's it's just the fact that Nebraska has gotten a little redder while while Omaha has become swingier. Um, I, I, I mean, and the visionary, like, the vision of Charlie Kirk. You know, the yeah, well, I mean, honestly, uh, among the, the Charlie Kirk things we've seen over the years, this this does not really break like the top 10 of like, uh, like objectionable. Yeah, I'm kind of like, oh, okay. doesn't break the top 10 of this week. Pretty, yeah, he was, exactly. He was talking like about that. how birth control make women depressed this week. I've got that audio mm -hmm. queued up for the for the other podcast. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, it's but, the but, men they're having sex with, as on birth control, that are making them depressed. Sorry, uh, go ahead. Okay. 
so 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 I I actually I don't know I was I meant to look this up this morning and then did not like the the uh, the way the different legislative sessions overlap like are we hundred percent sure that Maine would actually have the ability to respond in time to change their I own? can field that question Maine is out of session but e both the governor and the legislature have the right to call special sessions in Maine so you know so a ex I don't know if you have, we have any Maine listeners but an excited core of state senators or, or legislators in Maine could do this or the governor yeah, so I guess my basic read is it would just be kind of a, a bummer, like good for Charlie for trying to put points on the board for his team uh, in a like sneaky legal way. Um, but I, you know, I, I like the silliness of the map. I like the way it it uh, it lets the the wonks and the the eggheads on Twitter do fun things with their predictions. Um, I don't know. It's uh, it's I don't know what to what to say about it other than I I guess I had not. It, it is it is bizarre to imagine uh, that that. Flipping Omaha. I mean, I guess it's sort of like Miami Dade, right? In two thousand, but it, it would be kind of funny if, if the twenty twenty four election came down to uh, Omaha and their zoo. Do they have a nice zoo? They have a really nice zoo. Mm. Great stakes too. Uh, here's the thing: five hours and ten minutes. That's how. That was the. That's the time distance between when Charlie Kirk said this on his podcast and the governor of the state put out a statement being like, "We should do this." And the story here is about the new wave of MAGA activists to whom Republicans feel enormously beholden uh, and enormously responsive to. And um, I think that the, the, the big story is just like Charlie Kirk, who sits, I mean, look, and I'm not, uh, I think we should all be allowed to be unshaven and un- uh, Kempt on our political podcasts because you know we're not here to be let leave that to Hollywood. Okay, we're here for our ideas. You're here mm -hmm. to 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 deal with our brains, but still, this kid looks like you know he's been run over by a tractor and just sits there spewing nonsense, and he is in the driver's seat on a lot of Republican policy. And so the fact that that Repub the Republican governor, who it was nice to have a reason to learn the name of the Nebraska governor, uh, which is, I didn't know, Pillen. Jim Pillen. Uh, Jim Pillen, good to know, uh, that he, he's listening to Charlie Kirk and the Charlie Kirk is giving directions. To me, that was the, the big takeaway. It is alarming in that, I agree with Edgar, this is not a particularly alarming suggestion by Charlie Kirk, it's kind of a logic suggestion, but yeah. just the fact that there are state governors that are responding to him, um, you know, I, I don't, that, that probably doesn't say good things t about access to birth control in red states, for example, if, if uh, governors are going to be just so responsive to Charlie Kirk. I, and his can I, can I say one thing Please. To, to, to push back on that a tiny bit? Because I, I, I do agree that it's, it's completely alarming. I, I, there, there is, you'd want to see like a control group, right? Because, I mean, I think part of the reason why there's this quick reaction time is because you see a guy like Pillen who sees a post like that and is like, oh, well, actually, I, I totally do agree with that on the merits. It is just just like free points for our team. It's it's above board. You know, it's 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 it'd be political, but it'd be fair for us to do that. I mean, Trump and, and would so, love me for it. Right. Right. And, and whereas when when Charlie Kirk, for instance, goes on like a week's long crusade about how we shouldn't any longer celebrate the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., that's not exactly the kind of thing that, that you get, like the institutional Republican Party lining up to be like, yeah, let's let's get rid of that as a national holiday. You, you know what I mean? Like, so, there are a handful of people that are that were intrigued by that. There are a handful. Well, of no, I didn't see anything from Pillen about it. <laughs> Maybe not Jim Pillen. OK, well, we're going to test something out here um, about just how responsive politicians are to podcast hosts. And I think it'd be healthy for Democratic politicians to be less responsive to podcast hosts. But also Agree. it's time to fight. So Janet Mills. I'm looking at you right now. You have five hours from the posting of this podcast. Let's get this thing happening in Maine. All right, let's 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 just clean this thing up. We don't have to wait for Nebraska. It's just we can make sure to unify Maine's electoral votes to ensure, do our part to protect us from a Donald Trump autocracy. Janet Mills, we're watching you here at the Next Level Podcast. Do you know who Janet Mills is, Sarah? I do now. <laughs> uh -huh. um, this podcast is sponsored. Not by Janet Mills. We'll see, actually. Who knows? Maybe we'll have her on. Um, but uh, this podcast is sponsored by Z-Biotics. If there's a surefire way to wake up feeling fresh after a night of drinking, it's with Z-Biotics. 
Uh, for listeners who haven't tried it yet, Zubatic's pre-alcohol probiotic drink is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zebiotics pre-alcohol probiotic produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. Just remember to make Zebiotics pre-alcohol drink your first drink of the night. Drink responsibly and you'll feel your best tomorrow. You know who didn't do that? Producer Sebastian. He was letting me know. On Monday, that he was he was a little, running a little ragged. He was running a little ragged Monday morning. Was trying to shake him down to do a YouTube video. Make sure you're checking out Tim's takes on YouTube, the Bulwark's YouTube feed. Subscribe, and uh, and uh, you know the response time was okay, but you know he was lagging a little bit. And I said, well, have you been have you been you know doing what our sponsor suggests? You know, have you been engaging in a Zbiotics probiotic drink? before you go out in the evening. And um, that is, I think, a suggestion that he should be taking into account this weekend. Because that's the best way to feel refreshed. Right, Sebastian? So you, Sebastian, and our listeners, go to zbiotics.com slash next level to get 15% off your first order when you use next level at checkout. Zbiotics is backed with 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash next level and use the code next level at checkout for 15% off. Thank you, Zbiotics, for sponsoring this epi- episode and our spring break all right we are back and uh we're going to discuss the descent into fascism um jonathan last who's not here on this podcast this week which i know people are sad about uh, we want to represent him um in spirit by discussing his newsletter his newsletter created quite a stir on the right wing internet um luckily i'm on spring break so i didn't get to spend that much t- as much time as i usually do on right wing twitter uh, but I did catch it out of the corner of my eye. A few people that were upset with Jonathan. His take was this. If Trump wins, he'll run for a third term and the Republican Party and the Supreme Court will let him. Subtle. Um, it's a subtle take there. Uh, Sarah, you and Jonathan sometimes argue about things. What was your What is your take? Do you think it is cer- Do you think that is true? If Donald Trump becomes the president, that he will run again in 2028 and the Republican Party and the Supreme Court will let him? Uh, no, probably not. Probably not. Uh, the, probably the, not. Probably not. I mean, the, let, the, the letter of the law on this is pretty, pretty clear. Um, I do think that JVL, I'm interested actually, can you, before I tell you what I think, can you tell, I missed the right wing Twitter reaction mm. to what he said. What was it? Oh, JVL has TDS. JVL's a grifter. J blah, 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 blah. JVL's brain has been broken by Donald Trump. Blah, 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 blah. This isn't really going to happen. Even though that there was an article pushing for this in the American conservative magazine. So here's where I think, let me give JVL his, his due because what JVL, where he sort of like pointed for his shot, right? When he like put his finger up and said, I'm It's going here. He, what he said was at some point there's going to be a movement to eliminate the 22nd Amendment and to say that Donald Trump can be president for infinitum. And who was uh, right about that? And he was right about that, yeah. right? The American yeah. conservative came out yeah. with uh, a, a whole long piece about how, uh, you know, Donald Trump should be allowed to do this. Why should we ignore the will of the people? If somebody, if a president after a four year hiatus, you know, has some time out is so popular and so ex- people are so excited to have them back that, that they are reelected. Why shouldn't they get uh, another consecutive term? So, uh, so uh, just he, really quick while we are giving his, uh, his due other things that yeah. he was right about that these butt boys on the internet were not right about, uh, include the fact that Donald Trump was going to attempt a coup that he was going to try to stay in power even if he loses, uh, and uh, that the Republican Party was going to go along with that. That's another thing that he said that uh, the National Review was like, never, no, uh, no, sorry. No, that is actually what ended up happening. And then he said that Donald Trump is going to, that they are are not going to convict him. And then that Donald Trump is going to run for president again, and everyone is going to get behind him. And everyone, when he said that, with all the right-wing folks, uh, bloggers at the corner, were like, no, that's a no, uh-uh, it's over. He said, Mitch McConnell said, we were finally rid of the bastard to Jonathan Martin for his book. And uh, he was right about that. And so, you know, that's just, those are some interesting facts to maybe con- con- consider when you, when you look into the crystal ball here. And this is why, as I fight with JVL, I am mindful 
that uh, my optimism has been crushed by reality uh, over and over and over again. And so I'm more circumspect before, uh, you know, tussling with JBL. Now, I will say, though, JBL often takes these very definitive positions uh, that I think strike just a little. So, for example, I'll just tell you where JBL has been wrong. I love doing this when he's not here. All we right, should have too. a whole segment when he's not here. Same. Sorry, buddy. You're not here. Let's all let's talk to JBL's always wrong segment. That's what you get uh, for going on spring break, bro. Yeah, but he was like, right, he's like, DeSantis is going to drop out before Iowa. You know, he had this whole DeSantis, and I was like, no, he's got He's going to go through Iowa's whole campaign. So, you know, it's like things like that. Sometimes JBL can just go just a little bit extra, mm-hmm. uh, but that's what makes his newsletter exciting. And he's directionally correct about uh, the level of acquiescence. And I actually, I thought this newsletter was, uh, it was a good trip down memory lane about all of the big moments when Republicans rationalized their way out of accountability uh, for Trump. And so I think that taking his broader point, that there's no reason that we should be so certain that the institutional right will not do everything they can to do whatever Donald Trump wants. I think he's right about that. Where I think I'm not sure he's right is the idea that the Supreme Court Let's that happen. I mean, he 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 kind of uses as evidence of that. Like he's basically got me convinced that the institutional right, including uh, the political class, will let Trump will will start making this argument. Oh, it was stolen from Trump. He was treated so unfairly. I don't think the Supreme Court upholds it. I still have a decent amount of faith in uh, in the Supreme Brett Court. Brett Kavanaugh, not, beer. Just not going. Just not going totally off the rails. Yeah. I, I I don't think so. And I, I think if they were. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I, was saying, I want to get into the Supreme Court disaster porn at the end of this, um, but I want to engage Edgar first on just the principle. Uh, Andrew Edgar, here's my question. What do you think is the percent chance that if Donald Trump wins that he that what JVL says is right, that he would run in 2028 and that people would essentially go along with it? I, uh, I think the percent chance is very low. I'm not a math guy. I'm going to say 5 or 10%. 5 or 10%? 10%. No, 5 or 10% is too high. Even. Or- I, I think it's... I think it's Three percent. So, so I, I I completely agree with with Sarah that yeah, say two three percent something like that. That's um, pretty high. That's pretty. Yeah, that's too well, high. I, it's I, higher I, than I it's been. I mean, it's higher than it's been historically. Like since FDR left, it's it's certainly. Are we are, are we saying been. is this the percent chance that every domino lines up correctly and he okay, is okay? Like, maybe not that every single down. domino in the newsletter lines up correctly, but that he the Donald the Donald Trump would through some various level of machinations. Uh, be on the ballot in 2028, that he would try so, to run or that he would, or the, the elections, the I don't know, who the hell knows. Uh, you know. The difficulty I have with the question is that I, I I struggle to see psychologically why Donald Trump would want to run again if he wins. Because, first of all, he will be insanely old by then. Um, but, but so much of his rationale for running in 2024 was the complete inability to get over you know, he, he not being able to be a, lo- a loser to Biden in 2020, needing to relitigate that, needing to stay out of jail. He doesn't really have like a, a a substantial political project that he's like dying to like, you know, go to his last breath, uh, bringing about for America, it seems. You don't think, um, you don't and, think that the Democrat, whoever that would be, that would emerge in 2027 or 2028 would run on a platform of wanting to jail Donald Trump? Because I do. I guess that's possible. Yeah, I don't know. You you think so? I mean, um, I, I mean, I think. Well, for starters, I think that he will have won and then pardoned himself, and uh, right. I think it's pretty safe. We can all agree on this. It's pretty safe to assume that he'll probably do some more crimes between twenty twenty five and twenty twenty eight. Okay, I had not heard that part. Of I think it. Yeah, that's yeah, pretty yeah. clear that he'll probably do some more crimes. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe he'll just decide to golf and like be so happy that he won that he'll just golf and like whatever, just hang out. But I think he'll probably not. Probably he'll do more crimes, and so then. Thing. The one other, the one other psychological point that I want to make though is less about Trump and more about the the base, which is that. Um, and I was I was you know covering campaigns full time uh, through the whole, uh, basically the the whole primary cycle as it existed, such as it was uh, before I came over here. And 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 very routinely, I mean, I I, I think it's easy to undercount the amount of support that Trump got in this election in particular from Republican voters who. Uh, had kind of imbibed his his idea that a his first term was kind of 
Um, it was kind of mean what they did to him, you know, throughout all that. He didn't get as much stuff off the ground as, as he should have. But B, he was really robbed in 2020 because he he, he didn't lose that election, they all think. Um, and, and, and so a, a lot of voters found that a very persuasive reason not to even really think about other alternatives in the primary, um, you know, who, who would potentially perhaps have been Ron DeSantis people or, or you know, who, whoever else, uh, the big Ramaswamy people. They're like, well, no, look, like this is still Trump's year. He needs his second term. He deserves his second term. But these are still people who are thinking in terms of presidents have two terms, right? Um, so it, I, I think that's it, all fair. It, I want to throw this happened, out. Right? I, I think that's all fair. I, took, I, I think it's all fair and practical and wise even. I'll say this though, you forget how long all this stuff is. And so this is my JVL. This is my most, most full throated defensive JVL, who I, I think obviously was, was being a little definitive. But my, my point is the, the, the questions, the gray area here when it comes to Donald Trump, uh, just consider this. If, if Andrew Egger and I were on a podcast and Sarah Longwell in April, April 3rd of 2016, and we said, and I said to you, what is the percent chance that Donald Trump wins this election in 2016, becomes the president, loses in 2020, tries to stay in power, and a mob of people storm the Capitol attempting to assassinate his vice president? I, I would think that, I, I mean, I would know what I would have said then. Zero See? percent. Zero percent. One oh, but percent. Then, no, but two uh, percent. All of that. And then the Republican Party wants him back. Back. <laughs> Like, who would have been, like, absolutely not? Insane. And I had TDS. And I was, yeah. like, the leading. And in April of 2016, I was, like, the the, lead, the spokesperson for the Republicans Against Trump movement, literally. And so, and I would have said 0%. So, anyway, this is not to say that what everything that JVL says is going to turn out. But when you have someone such as Donald Trump, who has autocratic aspirations, who has just the worst imaginable character, who is going to be fighting jail... I think for the rest of his days, no matter what happens, um, who the fuck knows what he'll do? And he gets older and more deranged and all this. Who the fuck knows what he's going to do? And, and and then there's always the JVL point about. And then I, I think the Supreme Court would do the right thing, probably too. I'm with Sarah on this. But then what? Then it's like okay, the the who the marshal of the Supreme Court's going to arrest Donald Trump. Now we get back into that territory, right? I, I, this is all fantasy porn. It's all it's all t uh, but like. It's fantasy porn because we're in a situation where, like, all of that is on the table. None of that has ever been on the table before. None of that has been on the table since the Civil War, I, I, you know, with the FDR situation accepted. Like, none of that has been on the table, and it's all on the table. So, like, I, I, you know, the people who are just like, absolutely not, JVL, you've had your brain broken. Well, they've been wrong for nine years, and we're in unprecedented times. So that's my defense of JVL. I don't know, Sarah, yeah. you had any? You know, well, I will just say that, you know, what was the famous line about... 9-11 it was we suffered from a failure to imagine yeah. and like at this point we are we are not doing our jobs we're not i mean like if if you don't sit and think about the potential problems uh that could arise like you're ignoring everything that we've been faced with over the last seven years that yes of course we thought couldn't happen because of institutions and norms and boy, this stuff just doesn't happen, so it can't happen. And we should not suffer from a failure to imagine now. And I think it's good, uh, even if JVL, I think, has, you know, some sort of misses at the margins with how extreme things is like, again, directionally correct in the idea that we should at no point discount what Donald Trump will want to do and what the Republican Party will let him do. Andrew, any final thoughts on that before we get really into, into the, the bad place? No, I mean, I think we, we wrote in Morning Shots uh, a couple days ago, maybe yesterday, about um, there was a piece up, up at the Bulwark about the possibility of this upcoming election, um, uh, Trump Trump trying to steal it again, essentially through uh, essentially just having state legislatures uh, assume control over over the uh, appointment of electors rather than giving them to the to the whoever wins the popular vote in those states, um, which you know, they could do uh, under right. under the apparatus of the Constitution. There, there's nothing preventing that from happening. And I think, like, it is true. Like, like I, I already said why I think all these things are, are un extremely unlikely. Um, but, like you say, one of the, one of the uh, annoying things about the present moment is that you really have to think about things in, in terms of what's actually excluded by, by you know, the, the, the real curves. And I, and I do think, you know, the Supreme Court 
the, the, the text of that amendment, as you say, uh, if, if the words on the page mean anything, it's excluded. Yeah. Um, but I guess that's... that's Are you a, ready for this idea? How about this? How about Donald Trump says that he only will endorse a candidate in 2028 who agrees to make him vice president? Because the vice, because the vice president, uh, um, the vice, it's not quite as clear. We had, I've, I've had a, I've had an extended uh, side chain with some legal experts and some Obama people who, um, who believe that like, it's really not so clear that Joe Biden couldn't name Barack Obama vice president. Like, it's pretty clear. Like, the intent is pretty clear, but it's not. It's sort of closer to the Fourteenth Amendment situation than the Twenty Second Amendment situation. So, you know, anyway. I think my Putin overwhelming did. feeling, my overwhelming feeling about all this is. Like, let's, let's just get them. through this election. Let's like, let's get through 2024, okay. then we'll deal with it. I'd <laughs> like to beat him. <laughs> All right. So yeah, we're slowly well, actually, sorry. I would like, And I would like to see some humility from the National Review crowd, Thank the you. crowd Same. that suggests uh, that none of these things could ever happen uh, because they've been wrong literally For all the time. For a decade. Yeah, if you've been wrong for an entire decade about what the Republican Party is going to do, then just, like, leave a little bit of openness to the fact that yeah. maybe you're wrong again. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about Gaza. Um, there was a, I know, sorry, uh, but uh, the Israel, uh, the Israeli government um, uh, did an oopsie, and the IDF killed uh, seven uh, people that were part of the World Central Kitchen, the Jose Andres operation. Uh, three Britons, a Palestinian, a U.S. Canadian dual citizen, a Pole, and an Australian. Um, I, I just, I, I feel like this bears mentioning. Um, so there, they they were in a world uh, health kitchen uh, vehicle uh, that was hit by a missile. Uh, then they left the vehicle, got into another car, which was hit by another missile, and then the third car in the convoy approached to pick up the occupants of the second car, and that was hit by a third missile. The strike killed all of the workers in that convoy. Um, you get to do. I think you get to do oops on one vehicle. I think on three, I'm not sure you Again, get. Yeah, I'm not a military expert, so uh, this is podcast neither. is not going to be about like the Israeli strategy here and and what exactly uh, to do, how to implement a strategy. I just I do think that what I want to get to here is the political implications. And when you have a situation where you fire three missiles at people that are providing food, volunteer service to in, in an area that is at risk of famine. Um, uh, you know that's something that you got to answer for, and and that uh, you're gonna and that is gonna cause downstream effects. One of those downstream effects statement put out by the White House, Joe Biden said he was outraged and heartbroken by the killings. Demands a swift investigation into them that would bring accountability, and the findings of that investigation must be made public. This is not a standalone in- incident, he says, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, look, I, I just I think that there was a period of time. What I want, what, what I want to bring this up is I think that. Uh, maybe probably the last time we discussed this issue in this podcast, there was a sense that like this is bad, the situation is bad for Biden, it's bad for Israel. Obviously, the Hamas actions are bad. It's just bad all around. Uh, but you know, maybe by November, by the fall, um, this will not so much be a front of mind issue anymore. It will be a back burner issue. I don't really feel that way um, anymore, um, and uh, it doesn't seem like there is uh, a, a plan out of this. And I think that Joe Biden is in a pretty tough spot where he's now got. I think it's going to be very hard to appease the people that are the people that are calling him genocide Joe and the activists um, with statements such as this. And every statement such of this such as this creates more distance from people that are wanting him to be stalwart with Israel. And even though Joe Biden is has hit the sweet spot on this issue for Tim Miller, I think that he's in the sour spot politically on it. So I don't know. I open it up to either of you. Uh, well, I'll say this. I don't know if you caught uh, the uh, focus group podcast that I did with uh, one Andrew Egger. I did. It was a uh, great episode. People should check yeah. it. I know it was another depressing episode because just like the degree of addiction to TikTok and how people are like mindlessly repeating TikTok talking points. I mean, like any activist organization in the world would dream of having their users and their followers repeat their talking points uh, just as mindlessly as the TikTok users repeated the TikTok talking points. It and was to like also shocking. have 
And to have such a bipartisan yes. uh, devotion, right? They're like, the young... they're like liberal TikTok users were like, <laughs> what about the small business owners? <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> like, yeah. <"It's> a... <laughs> just... yeah, the young conservatives are like, you know, they make their free speech. This is, you know, how can you let in the libs? Yeah. Uh, and everybody's in for the conspiracy theories. So anyway, uh, just different ones. But, but that's, we were focused on TikTok for the episode. And Andrew yeah. was awesome on the episode. His analysis was great. Uh, but what we, we didn't play as much of, well, there was a few snippets, uh, but was super clear in the group of young progressives. They had all voted for Biden, uh, in 2020, the people, and they were only about half the group was willing to say they were voting for Biden this time around. They weren't voting for Trump, but, and it wasn't because he was going to ban TikTok. It was because of Gaza, and they were getting a lot of their Gaza information from TikTok. And there was this sense among when they had their like, because for a lot of it, it's about like, well, this is information they don't want us to have. They were like, well, you know, they don't want us to know about what's happening in Gaza. And TikTok is where I get my information about Gaza. Uh, and I, you know, I, I've obviously understood for a while about the fact that this situation is presents a real challenge for Joe Biden. But I had been sort of sanguine as you had about the idea that like, this is going to shift, like it's not going to stay like this. Um, and I don't think it's too late now for it to shift, but I do think that like, look, I have such a pedestrian understanding of the Israel Gaza thing. So um, I'm not an expert. I am. I want Joe Biden to do the right thing, not just the political thing uh, when it comes to the situation in Israel and Gaza. That being said, I think it is a political catastrophe for him if it continues direct like this way. I also feel less certain than I might have three months ago that we're still doing the right thing by, uh, like... The, it's not just that this can't go on for political reasons. It's, it's that, like, at some point, the loss of life um, overall becomes uh, intolerable, right? The situation becomes yeah. overall intolerable, which is not to say that that the Israelis were not absolutely justified in a major response after October 7th and aren't still completely justified in figuring out how to obliterate Hamas. But, like, we are in a situation now where the you know, you're seeing aid workers um, get murdered. And I think, I think f not just for these voters that I'm listening to, but for me, when you see it, I start to be like, man, uh, yeah. this, it, you, you start to, people who like me, who I think are pretty, I'm pretty like on a gut level pro-Israel uh, and certainly anti-Hamas terrorist. But I'm like, man, Joe, I don't know. I don't know how long you can, we can just stand by while this is happening because I think we can't. Yeah, and the famine side of it, and this is why it ties to the world central kitchen. I mean, like they're, they're real, we are really at at serious danger of not just now people dying in Gaza because of missiles, but dying because of starvation. And so, if we're killing the aid workers that are just bringing food, right? Like, I, I, you know, again, that that helps. That that is why this is so important as a, both a, a political issue and a facts on the ground issue as as you know exacerbating the problem. Anyway, Andrew. Yeah, I, and I, much like Sarah, I mean, this is not my bailiwick at all. Foreign policy stuff. I mean, I, it 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 seems to me that there was kind of like a a, a normie case uh, that was intelligible to the average voter in the wake of October seven. Why Israel needed to go in. Uh, and and you know prevent something like that from happening again in in a in a war -torn, war torn region where they have tons of enemies you know they they needed to show strength and they needed to you know root out Hamas and they needed to do all of these things um, there is still an intelligible case for why Israel continues to need to, to to prosecute their war but it is not that like gut level thing that's just kind of like obvious uh, to to people I mean it's it's you essentially have to get into the all of the, the just war theory, you have to get into the acceptable risk. You have to say, okay, uh, Hamas started this war. Israel has a right to prosecute its military objective, which is rooting out Hamas. And Hamas uh, is is calculating uh, that that they their strategy is to, to hide in the civilian population and to hide in 
in, um, among aid workers and among hospitals and all of these things and, and, and ratchet up that international pressure uh, in order to get everybody to hate Israel, and you can't blame Israel for that. I mean, this is the, this is the intellectual case. Um, and and I, I don't know, I mean, like, that's the, these are kind of the, the, the precepts of who's at fault in war that, that underpin a lot of our international law. Uh, and so it's hard for me as a guy, just a lay person, to be like, well, you know, they can't do that. But at the same time, I mean, you cannot at all be surprised when the average person who looks at this stuff, I mean, they, 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 they look at the facts on the ground in Gaza right now. They see, uh, you know, not only that, that you know, two-thirds of the Strip has been bombed into rubble already with, with uh, you know, basically a million refugees clustered into Rafa and, and Netanyahu now continuing to say they're they're planning to go in and 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 take care of Rafa too uh, and and the the possibility of mass starvation and the the blockades of, of aid getting in um, and and now look at a flashpoint story like this where you have this this group this this world central kitchen convoy that was coordinating with the IDF that that was that was saying here here's where we're gonna be uh, and 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 don't bomb us. I mean, that's why they're doing that. They're doing that specifically to say, this is what we're doing. This is our itinerary. They're, we're in clearly marked vehicles. Um, so, so, I mean, again, like from a Norman point of view, even if it were true, which it did not end up being true, that there was some Hamas operative like who had gotten in the car with them that the IDF really wanted to take care of, how they make the moral case that that okay, sorry, you had a Hamas operative with you, so we need to bomb you, when these are the only people who are uh, have, have even one finger and one leak in the dike of mass starvation in that region. How you sell that uh, to the country when you're buying the bombs? I mean, like, it's, it's uh, like I said, and, and like, I'm not... What, I, can I just say, like, what I want to see from Joe Biden, right? Okay, they put out a statement, sure. Uh, but, like, we, if, if Joe Biden can't be a bystander, Right in this in this conflict, I, I, I think it is unfair to blame Joe Biden. I think it's unfair to call him genocide. Joe, he's not committing genocide. Uh, he didn't start this war, and you know, and and we have a responsibility to other democracies. But also, if we are going to help provide funds or munitions, uh, we are uh, we are part of this, and uh, and we have power in the situation. And I think that we should exercise that power toward an end that is because look here's what hamas needs to do they need to release the rest of the israeli hostages like the problem is is that you know everybody who calls for ceasefires and everything just sort of like forgets the idea that hamas took hostages that they have continued to rape and torture and uh and and in some cases kill uh and so like they need to release all the hostages but like where are we in a high profile way like getting to that end. Like, I think we should, like, that's about people coming to the table. That's about people negotiating. Um, and I, I think we've, we've got to figure out how to, Joe Biden's got to figure out and the administration how to take a more high profile role in looking like he is trying to resolve this as opposed to just letting it go on indefinitely. Yeah, Tony Blinken's been pretty good on that, but it's been a lot of behind the scenes. I mean, he's done some yeah, public stuff, but we could, we could use more Tony Blinken. Well, um, and can I, can I say one thing about please. that? I mean, the, at, cause I've been at the white house press briefing where they've gone back and forth and back and forth and back and forth on this. And they, you know, they're trying to lead with it. They're trying to say, you know, look, we're, we, we, we are working very hard to get to temporary ceasefire that would hopefully roll over into permanent ceasefire. And it is true that the, the biggest concrete obstacle to that is Hamas continuing to refuse to release these hostages and, and Biden and, and his administration have taken what seems like a pretty righteous line and saying like, okay, until that happens, how are you going to expect us to really put pressure on Israel to stop doing this? But at a certain point, I mean, like, you kind of have to contemplate the, the question of, does the Hamas strategy end up working? I mean, like, like, is it actually true that their calculation is correct, that there is an amount of collateral damage that's just unacceptable to, to even Biden and the White House, even, even people who are staunch pro-Israel allies, just because the, the situation becomes so grim and grisly uh, that, that at a certain point you have to essentially negotiate with terrorists. And, and I mean, I, again, I'm, I'm very happy that I am not at the table myself. I mean, it's, a, it's such a grisly, horrible um, situation for so many reasons. Yeah. Um, one more thing I just want to mention on the politics of this, and this is just, again, such a tragedy. I don't, I hope that there's no sense of, of glibness, um, in, in mentioning and in, in saying it was an oops, because it was just a tragic, horrific oops that is going to 
I think reverberate. And I, I was just pulling this up. The, uh, the 60 Minutes report on Abu Ghraib came out April of 2004. So this time, the 2004 election, obviously Bush ends up still winning. But I, this feels like the kind of thing that can reverberate as that did, right? Like you had like the, the, the general um, disaster, uh, the general humanitarian disaster obviously has has landed with certain folks, particularly those on the activist progressive left, left particularly younger folks. But, you know, uh, broadening out to get people that that have been more directionally sympathetic to Israel to start to have concerns like this is the kind of thing that can do it in the same way that Abu Ghraib did. Um, for Iraq. And, and I think that I, I mention this always when this stuff comes up, but it's not just kids, right? It's like basically anybody younger than Sarah, sorry, Sarah, like doesn't remember U.S. military successes. Like doesn't, like just don't, we don't have any, right? And so when you're coming, like I have a lot of people that, that sometimes email me that are more pro-Israel when I, when I express these concerns that are like, well, you know, did we have a did we have a plan for Germany post World War II? Like, no, we did what we had to do to win the war, and then you deal with it. And it's like, okay, yeah, but but I a huge. It's not just eight TikTok kids. Like, basically everybody up till middle age is like, I'm sorry, like I don't have a lot of tr- I, I, the trust, but Vera, you know, the trust that we'll take care of this, that we're going to do that, the military leadership is going to do the right thing, like. I, like that trust has has withered over the past couple decades, and so when you're co- when when Israel and and Joe Biden working with Israel cannot enunciate a okay here is the plan right for how we're going to stop the tragedy and get to some sort of temporary solution or or semi permanent solution, um, then then this stuff you know, then, then people start to like, look at the, the tragedy and say, I, I'm just not sure this is, this is going to be worth it anymore. And so I think that is, that adds to the political risk here. So anywho, um, that is the next level for this week. Oh. JVL will be back next week. And so it'll be so much more uplifting. We'll be so much happier with JVL around. He's just a ray of sunshine. As you guys all know, Andrew Egger, uh, make sure you're checking out his morning shots newsletter. It is wonderful. Listen to him and Sarah on the focus group podcast. We'll see you back here next Wednesday. You can catch me tomorrow on the board pod. Oh, wait, we also have another announcement. If you, if you haven't had enough of this uplifting episode with me and Sarah, we are back together. No Egger on the secret podcast on Friday that usually it's Sarah and JVL. So if you guys are not a Bulwark Plus member and you want to hear me and Sarah talk about women's basketball and other more fun stuff, let's do it. This is your moment. Become a Bulwark Plus member. We're back on Friday on The Secret Pod. And, you know, we're going to keep it light and breezy. How about that? Right, Sarah? Sounds good. Can't wait. We'll see you then. (laughs) 